Why is Israel erupting in protest again? I'm Matt Robeson. This is the Beyond Politics podcast. I am joined, as always, by my co-host, former U.S. Congressman Paul Hodes, and we are on the Blue Amp channel on YouTube. As we record this on the morning of July 11th, that's Eastern time in the United States, Israel has once again broken out in massive protests after an overnight vote in their parliament that pushed forward the far-right governing coalition's plan to limit their judiciary. Protesters see the plan as nothing less than a more stealthy version of the overt power grab that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced back in January and that led to a shutdown of the country in March. One of the co-founders of the central headquarters for the pro-democracy struggle is Gilad Sher. He is a former chief of staff and policy coordinator to Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and a senior peace negotiator. Mr. Sher, welcome to Beyond Politics. Well, we are really privileged to have you because events are unfolding as we conduct this interview. Reports came in this morning that thousands of Israelis have been demonstrating across the country on the heels of last night's vote in the Knesset. The images on your Twitter feed, which are a very important source of information about what's going on, it is my Hebrew is a little rusty, <laughs> but the images that are coming across on your Twitter feed are quite stunning. They include a protester who's been bloodied in the course of the protest. Can you just tell us what's going on the ground right now? Today is a, is a national disruption day with mass demonstrations throughout the country from north to, west, to, to south and from east to, to west. It's kind of a tour de force of, of the protests against the dictatorship. We have, by now, it started at 6 a.m. And we are t when we talk now, it's 4 p.m. Israel time. And there's already dozens of detainees, a lot of police brutality. My former partner in my law firm, a reserve officer in the combat unit, over 70 already, was hit by a police horse and is currently hospitalized. And there's extreme, what we call crowd control measures used by, by the Israeli police. Make no mistake, there's throughout the last six months of, of ongoing weekly and almost daily protests, no policemen were injured, not a single property was damaged. And, uh, and I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of people on the streets every week and sometimes more than, than just um, on a weekly basis. And uh, it seems that, uh, that the binary character of, uh, of the civil protest in Israel has become clearer than ever. It's dictatorship versus liberal democracy. That's the way things are. And we are facing, we the demonstrators and the, and of course the headquarters of the struggle for democracy, we are facing lies, manipulations, demonization, and delegitimation. And the truth decade is at its best here with fake news. And uh, these steps are accompanied by, uh, by uh, what the government does is looting the state treasury and a lot of false media incitement against, against us, most of us, all of us are Israeli patriots, progressive, liberal, democratic, people who serve uh, the country, who served the country and still serve it on, on, in, in multiple generations. And uh, the reason for that to, to be happening today is, as you rightly put it at the outset, was the abolishment of the reasonableness doctrine. It's where next coalition is heading to, to cancel the cause of reasonableness, to abolish this doctrine and to allow unreasonable executive decisions at the state level and at the local one, as well as the appointments of, of executive, government executives and civil servants in a way that, that would be anything but reasonable, and to eliminate the judicial review of such decisions. Can I ask a quick question? You wrote an op-ed in the Times of Israel yesterday predicting that we would see the kind of protest and the level of protests if the government did what, in fact, they did, eliminating judicial oversight based on the reasonableness standard. And your words were, the government is gambling that the public can be lulled into complacency about this. And clearly, the public has not been lulled into complacency. But from outside, looking outside in, it certainly doesn't sound as dramatic as the original plan from the Net New Coalition, which seemed designed to eviscerate limits on executive power. Could you explain in a little more depth why this move on the reasonableness standard is so dangerous and why you think people are 
protesting just as they did earlier? I'll tell you why. Because the, the Supreme Court, the High Court of Justice, will not be able to block anything that, that would seem unreasonable or, or out of the, the due process in terms of decision making on the state level. And because the law, this law will not allow the court to intervene. And I'm telling you, Paul, that the, at the outset, they tried to, to blitzkrieg us and to make the at the same time a simultaneous carpet bombing and target killing, killing in not, not literally, but of the gatekeepers. And, and throughout a series of, of protests, we succeeded in, in putting this, pushing that back and, and have a, a more sliced way of, of putting uh, the elimination of the civil society organizations, the women, the LGBTQ people, the environment, NGOs, etc., civil rights, whatever, just name it, to eliminate the strongholds of, of democracy in Israel in a different way, in a different way. There's currently over 190 terrible initiatives, legislative, legislation initiatives, and fascist laws, racist laws, anti-sectorial laws, etc. So they use different procedures, different legislative instruments, different ways of making government decisions, and more than all of these private legislative initiatives that, that are used each time in order to get to a market point. So when people do not see the, the entirety of, of, of their game, as happened in Poland, for instance, they cannot protest against each and every step that they are taking, against each and every piece of legislation. So people get, so they make a more sleepy protest and a more, a less alert kind of, of, civil, of civil resistance. And this is why at that point in time, we decided to, to have a national disruption day because this marks a, a very important benchmark in eliminating the Supreme Court and the, the judiciary altogether, a review over the executive. It does seem that for all but the most dedicated observers of Israel here in the United States, it, that this approach of, as you say, repackaging, having a more subtle and maybe a more insidious approach to dismantling the judicial branch of government in Israel, that this approach is working. The last we heard from the US media about this judicial takeover effort was really those dramatic protests in March. Reporting on what's been going on has been reduced dramatically. But it sounds like what you're telling us is that the drive to consolidate power is still there. It's just yeah. got a softer yeah, face so. and it's just, it's more diffuse. It's spread across 190 separate initiatives. In the period since those massive protests in March, there were supposedly negotiations going on between the pro-democracy coalition and the government coalition. Those negotiations broke down several weeks ago. Do you think that the government was truly looking for some kind of a compromise in those discussions, or uh, were they just playing for time in order to find a way to bring back their agenda in this quieter way? Definitely playing for time and, uh, and waiting for uh, President Biden to open the White House doors to Netanyahu because he is looking for a compromise. He is looking for a large, broad consensus of, of the people. The whole two and a half months of, of so-called negotiations, and I'm a negotiation, I'm a negotiation person, not to say expert, these were not negotiations. Then you put as a threshold to the negotiations, the totality of the judicial reform, and then you start, you start looking for compromises. That's not negotiating. You want to negotiate. No preconditions, sir. Okay, so I believe that the, this dialogue, or what you call the negotiations, was with the opposition, was a kind of fig leaf for Reverend Netanyahu. Was a kind of a lip service towards both the the foreign relationship that he wanted to establish in during this period, and altogether, there's a very known reason for the whole for the whole game here, except for the kind of a 
revengeful sentiment that they have in the extreme right and the, the ultra-Orthodox and, and the settlers. Netanyahu, let's not forget, is a defendant in a criminal trial going on for the last three, over three years now. And it comprises three very serious charges, bribery, fraud, and breach of trust. He's accused of serious crimes. He wants to perpetuate his rule and destroy the judicial system in order to save himself from possibly going to jail eventually. So for this, he bans the, uh, the Bar Association in Israel. For this, the, uh, the state corruption or uh, senior executives' corruption became normative in, in Israel. And I'm telling you, we still, even with this Polish, what we call the Polish salami, cut the, uh, the whole overall into uh, small slices, we consider this a, a really an existential threat to the uh, to the s- social fabric in Israel and to the uh, national even to the uh, national security of Israel, and that's what we are fighting for. We talk about really hundreds of thousands of people on the streets since beginning of January 2023, and if you accumulate all the numbers, these numbers compared to uh, to the USA, okay, if in the state you would have seen. Every week, every consecutive week for the 28th week now, about 15 to 20 million people on the streets Wow! every week. That's quite unprecedented in yeah. terms of the magnitude, the perseverance, and, uh, and the motivation of people to, uh, to go out and, uh, and speak up. We do not know at the headquarters what, what would the public look like in the next demonstration. We do not know how many people will show up. And sometimes we are we are taken aback by by the numbers. We now, as the as the headquarters of the of the struggle uh, of which I was privileged to be one of the founders, as you said, it, we currently coordinate 140 organizations, civil society organizations, NGOs, associations, groups, etc. And we also assist about 130 protest sites throughout across Israel. Uh, in the cities and the towns, in some cities you can find thirty thousand people on 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 a on a weekend, twenty five thousand people, sixty five and sixty five thousand people, etc. And and all those protesters, they say one thing: we will not live under a dictatorship. We will not live under a government which promotes only the Torah law or the the Jewish law over uh, over the state law. And uh, we have the right to our freedom, and we don't have the right to uh, to yield to this kind of overall of overall regime change, which is, in other words, it could. Yeah, here in this country, as we all know, we've been dealing with Donald Trump and the aftermath of the January sixth coup attempt, and the the kind of radical right wing. MAGA Republicans in our Congress. So in some ways, what we are hearing from you and seeing in Israel is unfortunately familiar familiar in some sense. You wrote yesterday that, and I'm going to, I want to read this because it's a very important and bold assessment for our viewers and listeners. You wrote, the real strategic aim of Prime Minister Netanyahu and each of his coalition partners is to dismantle all barriers to their unlimited power. Only thus can they achieve their uppermost objectives, which have very little actual public support, emerging unscathed from criminal proceedings, entrenching permanent privileges and exemptions from the duties of citizenship, or changing the regime from a liberal democracy to a messianic halakhic theocracy. Now, so it raises some questions. Is the government truly aiming to create autocratic, dictatorial power and a theocracy? Are there differences within the Netanyahu coalition? And finally, as to Netanyahu himself, does he really just care about only protecting himself from going to prison? And is he elevating that self-interest above all else? The simple answer is yes uh, to your question. This is where they aim They aim at. The problem is that even if you find, if you might find some more reasonable elements or components in his coalition, his base and the base of his partners in the coalition, the Kahanis, descendant of Rabbi Kahana, Meir Kahana, and, uh, and the fascist elements of the government, the ultra-Orthodox, 
they all grab him by you know what, and uh, and he doesn't have a uh, even if he wanted to head he wanted he doesn't have any kind of leeway to uh, to maneuver because of his coalition. So the question is, he Netanyahu in the last I would say seven eight years maybe a decade has lost contact with reality. There's some hybris there that is is due to I, I cannot offer a a psychological analysis. We don't have much time for that. But it is why, by the way, that in order for, for what's happening now to not happen in the future, if we succeed in this struggle, we want a constitution. We, we do not have a constitution. We have our Declaration of Independence of 1948, a constitutional body of, body of principles, and we have some basic laws that complement this uh, this quasi constitution. So I think that once we are over this, it might take maybe a year, maybe two years. I don't know. We are over that. We need to establish a constitution. We are seventy five years old now. We look towards the next seventy five years, and uh, and it seems obvious to us on an hourly basis, not even a daily basis, that the current government is trampling on our basic values, the very basic values on, the, by the way, the shared values that we do have with you, Americans, okay? So we need to have equality, we need to have justice, we need to have peace, we need to have freedom for the citizens of, of Israel, all the citizens of Israel, and for that we need a constitution because what we see now is a is an overall legislation and governmental decision making that is going almost precisely in the opposite direction by the way th there are people in this country who would say that we have a constitution but our supreme court is just making things up as they go along and that's so there's a value in that follow that similarity excuse me for for interrupting no that. please there's a very interesting similarity between pism and bibism just to show the rhymes that are happening between Israel and the United States, just this morning, President Trump filed to have his his classified documents case moved to after the election on the grounds that he can't possibly have a trial during the election. It seems like Prime Minister Netanyahu is providing him a playbook in real time for avoiding going to prison. I did want to follow up on your, on you made a comment a moment ago that when we're past this in a year and a half, in two years, I'm wondering what it looks like to get past this because with a prime minister who's seemingly fighting for his freedom and elements of his political coalition essentially holding him hostage to an agenda to radically remake Israeli society and government, is there a compromise possible? Is there a way out of this crisis or is this? simply a matter of you need to go to a sixth election and this government needs to be defeated democratically? That's an excellent question. I don't really know. I think that uh, what happened in the last couple of years and more importantly in the last couple of months is that, uh, that all the schisms within the Israeli society have been broadened up and deepened down. And the, uh, the secular religious, the Arab Jew, the uh, the settlers, uh, non-settlers, the ultra right towards the uh, center and the centrists and the, uh, the leftists, etc. And each one of the of those sectors is now, I would say, almost anchored to its own position. Where you stand depends on where you sit. You know this quite well from from your experience. There will be a compromise eventually because all conflicts come to an end sometime in a way that that is either political or bottom up from from the people up and the from the society up i don't know what kind of compromise we can we can possibly look for but i can say one thing the precondition for that is to um, roll back all the uh, legislation and governmental decisions and the uh, and government's corrupt decision as to as to the state treasury etc the allocation of funds to non-serving sectors and to and to, on, on on the account of welfare, healthcare, education, and even security. I don't see it coming neither soon neither sooner nor later. But I can tell you one thing: we we hold on two preconditions only: the protesters, 
One, you have to agree to the principles of the 1948 Declaration of Independence. And number two, we conduct a non-violent struggle. We are not violent, even if we are attacked by either ultra rightists or other, or other elements of the society, or even by the police or other forces, whatever. We are not violent. We are not, we are not yielding our basic democratic rule of law and, and other foundations of this state. And if anyone on the other side would like to come up and talk with us or handle a negotiation process with us, what we say, you're welcome. But if what you put, but if you first look at, at the, uh, the size of the rope that, that you're hanged by, and then let's talk about the color of the rope or with the executor, whatever, then there's no way to, uh, to be talking to one another. I truly hope that, uh, that this wave of, of violent overhauling of our regime will be over sooner rather than later. And I, but I don't know, I cannot predict the outcome and when it would happen. Let me get you out of here on a hopeful note, perhaps. You said a moment ago that eventually all conflicts like this come to a resolution of some kind. And in fact, you joined our recent guest, Dan Perry, who led a coverage of the Middle East to write about this crisis last week. And by the way, his site, which is called Ask Questions Later, is an outstanding read, and I recommend it to everyone. And you titled your piece that to say that there is a silver lining in this crisis. Sure. I want to, so let me, let me push you on this. Tom Friedman wrote last month in the New York Times that, and he's quoting from the economist Dan Ben David, that the new government budget includes an unprecedented allocation to settlers and the ultra-Orthodox, including full funding of schools to not teach English, science, or math. The budget is more than Israel invests in higher education altogether. And he also notes that the ultra-Orthodox share of Israeli population doubles roughly every 25 years. Today, it's 24% of the infants. By 2050, it will be half of Israel infants, Israel's infants, and none of them learn basic civics, separation of powers, or how liberal democracy works. But in the face of that, you and Dan do still believe that there is a silver lining, that there is a bright future that can come out of this crossroads that Israel has come to. Why do you feel that way? I didn't say a bright future. I could. I, I can say a brighter future. Okay, let's stick to that. I always have hope that things will get better. I personally fought in Israel's wars. I lost a lot of, of my classmates and unit mates and friends. I also fought for peace. I dedicated a lot of my of my career to uh, peace building, to peacemaking with the Palestinians, to research that, and to actually negotiate it with different heads official and non-official heads. And I believe that we have three three problems that you mentioned that, that should be on the table and cannot be tabled for long. And the first one is the judiciary, or if you want the separation of powers, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislative branches of government. And, and this is very important. We don't, the disassociation of state and church is, is tightly connected to that. Second one, is the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox. It's not just a matter of just a matter of having them be mobilized to, to serve in the army like we do at the age of 18, compulsory service, etc. It's their their introduction into the world of, of employment, into, into being serving citizens and not only on the receiver side, etc. And I think it's it's possible. It's possible. It's doable. There's a trend there that is look that looks for a more integrative approach to the Israeli society, and don't listen just to the uh, the extreme voices out there. I think this is doable. And the other elephant in the room, which has not been very visible during the six months demonstrations here, is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The resolution of this conflict, which is a very complex conflict with the core issues of Jerusalem and the holy sites and territory and security arrangements and, of course, the Palestinian refugees. The fact of the matter is that we do not have boundaries that are recognized and secure 
And if we do not have boundaries, geographical boundaries and political boundaries, it affects all other aspects of our lives here, the private lives and the public lives here. We need to disassociate, to disengage Israelis and Palestinians, the ones from the others. This has to be reprioritized, if you wish, on the table of negotiation or public discourse, along with democracy. We cannot have just democracy for those who live in the in Israel proper pre-1967. If we want democracy, it requires also to not overlook our neighbors, our very close neighbors from the eastern side of, of Israel. I'm always hopeful that things could get better because, because I believe that we all have a normal life around here. The normal life means a, a normal life in a democracy, not in a dictatorship, not under an autocratic kind of rule, and not with laws that are 2,000 years old and, and completely erase the hundreds of years of common law and a and couple of dozen years of Israeli independent laws. Gilad Sher, thank you not only for joining us on Beyond Politics, but also for, along with your coalition partners, standing up for democracy and peace and we wish you well and safety for you and all the folks who are out on the streets today. Thank you. Thank you very much.